Okay, so now that we've talked a bit about parallel streams at a very high level, just enough to give you the broad, big picture view, I want to give you a peek under the hood of a parallel stream to kind of show you how it works internally. We will go through this in much more detail later, but I just want to give you a taste of this. And this is really the cool part. And this is the thing that you know, would, would separate out people who take this class from people who just sort of understand how to use parallel streams as an application developer. We're going to talk about how it works under the hood, because that gives you a better sense of a lot of things. Um, and I'll also talk about how to avoid common concurrency hazards in parallel streams. So how does a parallel stream work? Well, I love metaphors. I especially love visual metaphors. And so here's one fun visual metaphor to think about in terms of what a parallel stream is doing under the hood. So the, the way to think about this is that a parallel stream implements a variant of the famous map reduce model of parallel processing. So if you read map reduce, link down here, you'll learn about map reduce. Map reduce is used for all kinds of parallel computing, especially in large scale cluster or cloud environments. The way that Java 8 streams works is limited to a multi-core processor as opposed to a cluster of computers, but the same basic concepts apply. And so what you do is you, you take your original source of input, like the food in your fridge perhaps, and you partition it. So we might have you know, a loaf of bread, some lettuce, some uh, meat, cheese, and uh, tomatoes. By the way, is a tomato a fruit or a vegetable? Uh, I always thought it was a vegetable. My, my 10 year old son corrected me and said it's a fruit, and he's right. But uh, I always thought it was a vegetable too, so don't feel bad. But it's, uh, that's what happens when you actually go to school and learn these kinds of things. You, as you get older, you forget that stuff. So a tomato is a fruit, um, although it doesn't taste very sweet. It has to do with the fact that it has internal seeds. Um, so that's, that's partitioning. So we take our input, we break it up into partitions, and then we do the map phase. And the map phase is where we do some processing, right? So we, we slice our bread, we shred our lettuce, we cut up our meat and our cheese and so on and so forth. I guess we, you dice, you would like dice cheese, I suppose, shred lettuce, slice bread, whatnot. Um, and then when you're all done, you put everything back together again to form the reduced result, which in this case would be a sandwich. And in practice, of course, if you were doing this in, a, in like a subway restaurant or whatever, you'd end up with a bunch of different results. And these things could all run in parallel, right? Because you might have different people doing different things. By the way, if you go to, uh, to subway, if you go to subway, you'll often notice they, they pipeline stuff, right? So they'll have somebody who you know, asks your, takes your order, gets the bread, puts the meat on the bread, puts it in the toaster. They take it out, they put it down, and they slide it down. And then the next person puts on the various um, you know, uh, condiments or vegetables or whatever you want. You know, so they have like a pipeline going. It's, it's kind of an interesting hybrid model for parallel computing. The way that the parallel streams actually work under the hood is more of a three-phase process. It's not really just map reduce. It's really split, apply, and combine. But that doesn't sound as good as map reduce. So everybody calls it map reduce, but it's really not map reduce. It's really split, apply, combine. And you can read this article here at the bottom link to learn more about that paradigm. And the way that that works, we've kind of talked about this before, but we do split, where you're going to take your original data, like a collection of some kind, and you're going to split it up into pieces, like slicing a pizza. That's what the splitterators are for. And when you're done, you've got chunks. And splitterators are defined on collections in Java 8, or you can make your own if you so desire. You can make custom splitterators. We, we talked about one of those when we talked about the the uh, search stream gang example. And as we talked about before, parallel, strider, parallel streams perform better if the data source can be split efficiently and evenly. And we'll come back and I'll, I'll show you more about that as we get further into this stuff. But that's the thing to remember. Things like array lists split really well. Things like link lists split really bad. And so knowing those distinctions helps to make you a better parallel streams programmer because you'll pick the right abstractions to use. The second phase is the apply phase, where we take these chunks that were split by the split phase, and we feed them off to the fork join pool. And they run in a common fork join pool. So we have the pool of worker threads. And that then goes and runs them in parallel. The chunks are run in parallel. Each chunk will be run sequentially, but all the chunks are run in parallel. And the, the chunks can be further split. And so splitting and applying can actually run in parallel as well. 
programmers have a little control over some aspects of this. They can control, for example, the number of threads that are in the pool. Remember, remember how that works. You can either set a system property to say, I want all the, I want all the streams in my process to use 10 worker threads. So that all the streams will share these 10 worker threads, which is kind of a coarse grain way of doing things. You can also do finer grain ways of controlling the threads by using managed blockers. And we'll talk a bit more about that again in this context, but just recall what we had talked about when we discussed the fork joint pool earlier. And then the final phase is the combined phase. So you take all the intermediate results that are created during all the processing that takes place in the different threads, in the different um, cores, and we merge them or join them all back together to get a final result. And that's what's performed by these terminal operations like collect or like reduce. And you'll get a lot more experience with that. Yeah? So fork join is the parallel computing engine. And as you can see here, parallel streams is a facade that wraps a functional programming API around the fork join pool parallel processing engine. And so parallel streams is responsible for using splitterators to split up the data source into chunks. Those chunks are then fed to the fork join pool, which does the processing. That's the apply phase. And then the results of those things come back, and the streams framework is responsible for joining everything together. And it all works in a very clean, functional programming way, so you don't have to think about the details of how it all works under the hood. So again, the easiest way to remember it is that the fork join pool is the processing engine, and the streams framework, or parallel streams variant of the streams framework, is just the facade that wraps it so you don't have to worry about all the gobbledygook that you're doing in assignment two, where you're having to break things up manually, and you have to write classes, and you have to write the compute method, and you have to do explicit forking and joining and all that stuff. That's all handled for you by the streams framework. Let's talk, uh, in the few minutes we have remaining, let's talk briefly about avoiding concurrency hazards. So concurrency hazards are all about not stomping on the data through race conditions. Remember, a race condition is, is something that arises. It's, it's a bug that arises when an app depends on the sequence or the timing of threads for it to run or operate properly. So if you have race conditions, it means there's just problems waiting to bite you in your code, and they'll undoubtedly bite you when you uh, least expect it, and in the worst, most pernicious possible way, so they're bad things. Um, so let's take a look at some of the problems here. The, the whole thing stems from the evil of side effects. And if you take a look at this link, it'll explain a bit more about what side effects mean. But basically, you don't want behaviors that are the, those are the things that are passed as the functions in to aggregate operations like map and filter and so on. You don't want those things to have side effects, because if they have side effects, then they are going to have shared mutable state, and insanity and chaos will ensue when you run them in a parallel stream. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. So one of the most common mistakes is to use a stateful lambda expression, where the results depend on shared mutable state, right? So this is a bad, bad thing. Here's an example. This is an example where the state can change in the parallel execution of a pipeline. The code that I'm about to show you here will work perfectly fine if we don't put the parallel call here. If we put the parallel call here, then what's going to happen is we're going to create ourselves a new object type of type total called t, right? So we say new total, and here's total. And you'll notice that total has a counter that keeps track of stuff. And you'll notice it has a multiply method that takes the parameter and multiplies the total by n and updates the total. So m total is an accumulator that's updated by a call to multiply. Well, so far so good if you have a sequential program, no problem. When you have a parallel program, however, multiple threads will be calling the multiply method on the instance t of type total. And if you look at multiply, you can see that there is, in fact, no synchronization on the m total field, which means that any time you call this thing, it's going to basically be accessing shared mutable state. m total time equal n is shared mutable state that is not protected by any kind of synchronizer. So 
not surprisingly, bad things will happen. And if you want to prove this to yourself, try running this example here at the bottom, the EX16 folder, and it'll show you how it blows up. Another problem is called interference with the data source. This occurs if the source of the stream is modified within the pipeline, which is also a big problem. So you never want to have change while you're doing the stream processing. And here's an example. What we do here first is we make ourselves a list of 10 integers in the range 0 to 10. We box them up into an integer and collect them into a list. So we have a list of integers. And now we want to run a parallel stream where we're going to try to print the values out, but we're also going to remove the item from the list as we are iterating over it. So peak, the peak call is just sort of like um, a method that inspects something. It's meant to have basically uh, no destructive side effects on the stream itself. But in this case, we're actually removing the elements in this list as we're running it through the stream. And uh, this will just absolutely go berserk. So if you run the EX11 example, it will do insanely crazy things and uh, bad things. So you do not want to do this. You do not want to change the underlying data source while the stream pipeline is processing it. So do not do that. Bad, bad, bad. Um, the right way to do this is to have various um, methods that are, that are behaviors that have no side effects. These all are self-contained. They work on the parameters, and they return a result, but they don't make any changes internally to what's going on. So that's the right way to do it. If you can always write your behaviors as stateless operations, parallelism works great. There are a few cases where you can't get away with that for whatever reason. If that's the case, if you absolutely have to access shared mutable state, then make sure you protect it either by using synchronizers or by using some kind of concurrent collector, like a, a concurrent hash map, for example. That's for the rare occasions where you just cannot get around the fact that you have to share something between the threads in a parallel stream. Uh, the examples we'll look at generally won't have that characteristic, but it's important to be aware of it if you need it. OK, and that is the end of this section.